Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we're looking at study abroad programs with special guests, Dr. Nick Gozik, Dean of Global Education at Elon University in North Carolina, Dr. Heather Barkley-Hamir, President and CEO of the Institute for Study Abroad, IFSA, IFSA and Dr. Luchin Lee, Associate Vice President of Global Education at Gosher College in Maryland. Thank you all for joining us. This is just a, a such an important, important topic, particularly considering uh, the need to foster understanding, cooperation, and friendship across borders, which we see we see the repercussions of, of not having those kinds of ties uh, play out in the world today. Um, I'm going to uh, go over uh, to you, Nick, Nick but I'll, I'll set you up this way by, by saying that uh, study abroad programs enable students to, ex to expand their professional and personal horizons. Participating students are 19% more likely to graduate, 90% uh, more uh, find employment within six months of receiving degrees, 70% report higher job satisfaction, and they average 25% higher starting salaries. That's students participating in such programs. Although let's not ignore the fact that these stats might also be due to the fact that participating students are more likely to come from higher income families. International programs face many challenges and we have the pandemic, we have these uh, global conflicts, uh, conflicts that are going on, there are access issues uh, at the lower income levels. So uh, Nick, Let's just talk about Elon University, your program, and also how you personally see these programs and why you got involved from a career perspective in this part of the education um, uh, sector. Yeah, well, thank you. And thank you, Mark, for the invitation to join the conversation. I think for many of us, we have different journeys that have gotten us to where we are today. Um, I've now worked at a number of really fine institutions and each have been a little bit different. Um, Coming to Elon, I've, I'm now in my, I think, 21st, 22nd year in the field. And, you know, as I find myself at Elon, one of the things that drew me here was really the commitment to global education. We are ranked number one in study abroad uh, in the country based on uh, several different metrics, uh, Princeton Review, U.S. News and World Reports and Open Doors. Through the Congratulations, by the way. Thank you. Well, thank you. And, uh, We've been, I think, for 16 years straight uh, as number one. So uh, there's only one way to go down, as they say. But a lot of that has to do with careful planning, uh, scholarships, and the way our calendar year works. And, and, and so I'm really thankful to all the people before me. Um, you know, this year has, has been a little bit different at the same time. One of the things, you know, we talked about challenges, Mark, as you opened up. I do think there have been challenges, but I would actually start with some of the strengths. And I would say one of those strengths is the fact that uh, for our winter term, it's, one, it's, it's really our largest time when students go abroad. We saw the largest number of students apply uh, in the history of, of, of Elon. We had 1,200 applications for about 700 spots. Typically, we would have about seven to 800 applications for that cycle. So the good news, I think, is that students want to go abroad and that study abroad is not only part and parcel of being an Elon student, we're seeing that on other campuses as well. It's not questioned as much as it would have been, let's say 10, 20 years ago or more. Um, I think some of the challenges that we're seeing at the same time wouldn't be a surprise that come out of the pandemic. I think the pandemic has highlighted some of the, the, the gaps that already existed, as you mentioned, in terms of socioeconomics, race, ethnicity, et cetera. Um, it certainly created a lot of uncertainty uh, we're seeing a lot of stress amongst parents, students. People aren't quite sure, even when we have a program, you know, will it go? Uh, will things change? So there's definitely a lot of uncertainty there. Um, and I would say one of the most recent challenges we're having is around staffing. You know, earlier in the pandemic, a lot of people ended up um, really being very grateful of having, you know, a position anywhere in a, in a corporation and on a campus. Today, you know, we're seeing the reverse. Um, we're seeing a lot of people move out of education abroad, out of higher education, uh, more job flexibility, salaries. So some of that will be a real challenge as we move forward. 
So this is really interesting. Uh, Heather, are you are you finding um, the, these trends as well, where you have high demand for study abroad, um, but uh, some staffing challenges? Um, are you seeing that, that um, uh, as we're coming out of the pandemic, that you're able to go back to your previous oper- operating models? Or are you finding that you have to adjust your operating models to deal with people's new attitudes and, and change circumstances? Those are great questions, Mark. And, and first off, I just want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today and for hosting such an important conversation um, for higher education, not just for study abroad. Um, the trends for an organization like mine, where we work with hundreds of institutions, are a little bit different. So what we see is that campuses across the country are recovering in very different ways and at different speeds. And that then trickles through to how those campuses are working with their partners. So we operate in 18 countries. Our focus is on preparing students for the future. So study abroad as a piece of the degree, but not just a bolt-on piece as a a really additive part to how we prepare students for the future that's coming for them in terms of their civic engagement, their leadership, and the role that they play in society. So we see different campuses where their numbers look normal now, and we see some campuses that have not yet even started to allow study abroad after two years and may not in the fall even. It's, It's just across the board. Um, With respect to the hiring challenges and the retention, the employee retention um, that Nick was speaking to, that's playing out differently for us um, because we are not a campus. We're an independent not-for-profit. Students don't come to our office. The experience they want is abroad. It's already away from the U.S. Um, Last year, we made the decision to continue remote and to hire people um, as we rebuilt the organization where we found people who aligned to our mission, vision, and commitments. And so we've actually had tremendous success and we're bringing people into the organization who were not in education abroad. So those people who are out in the corporate world and they're looking for change and something to inspire them are coming to us. So we've actually been a real beneficiary of that. So you've you've seen a real shift in your business model and perhaps a more geographic dispersion um, and more reliance on these types of tools that that we're using today in order to communicate with each other. Yes, that's exactly right. And uh, Luchan, you know, it's it's so interesting. Goucher College has such a renowned history in this particular field. Are you seeing uh, a increased consciousness? Um, and, And perhaps you can just sort of describe a little bit about Goucher College's whole approach and philosophy to international education. And, 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 and do, are you seeing a shift in how students are seeing the value proposition of Goucher um, in connection to your international programs? Wonderful. First of all, uh, Mark, thank you for having, for having me here, representing Goucher, to speak about the very important topic about uh, study abroad. As uh, Mark and uh, Heather both shared the values in, from a professional perspective, maybe even a higher ability, the starting salary, et cetera, all those are values. And Goucher actually started the study abroad requirement as a liberal arts education 16 years ago, from 2006, the requirement started. It's one of the first U.S. institutions that required all undergraduate students of study abroad to graduate. And then certainly, Mark, as you said, there is a philosophy here. And then at the time, Goucher already had the vision, imagine 16 years ago, uh, to envision that this, as a requirement, this will really boost our students' global perspective through their academic disciplines and also their personal growth as well. So philosophically, as an individual maturing, getting independent, knowing the world, building connections, all those requires the, the threads, the networking that our students built through study abroad or other avenues to understand the world, inter, whether it's intercultural communication and intercultural competence or global leadership as Heather referred to. So I think there is a lot of philosophical foundation that Goucher require, requirement has for the study abroad. Certainly in the past year, you know, for any institution, whether it's the organization or institution requiring study abroad, the pandemic appeared to be a huge challenge. But the Goucher faculty and staff actually never give up. We're, we're being very resilient and creative, innovative in designing courses, virtual exchange platforms for our students to engage in. That's also built our philosophy. So even during the toughest time when international travel was almost impossible, 
and our faculty and staff collaborated. For example, we created two new courses. And one is the virtue, pure virtue exchange with the students around the world that they engage for the whole semester. The other course is also a semester long program, team taught by faculty members across disciplines, whether it's from STEM or a social, so a sociology or social science and humanities, and team talk from different perspectives regarding academic disciplines, how the global cultural issues are perceived or required from diff different disciplines. So that our faculty, again, stick, we never short exchange or short change our students for the commitment for global education. So this is what happens in the Gautier right now. What, what, um, how, how broad geographically is your interactions over at Goucher with uh, schools and, and study abroad um, partners? Mm -hmm. um, because when you look at the United States history of these programs, they started very much in Europe with a European focus. And even today, there's still a, a focus on the, um, the uh, countries with higher uh, incomes, the G7 countries and so on. Um, are, are we sending uh, students for study abroad in places like uh, countries in the continent of Africa? Are we, stay, are we sending st uh, students for study abroad in uh, South and Central America? Or are we mostly focused on, um, on uh, Europe, Japan, Korea, and so on, the, the, the more developed countries in China? Mark, as you mentioned at the beginning of our conversation, more than 50% of our U.S. students study abroad go to Europe. That's the case. In fact, we have statistics here. About 50% of our students at Goucher study abroad in English-speaking countries. Mm -hmm. And our goal in the next two years is to reduce that percentage from 50% to 35%. So this is a really require us to rechannel our students to the, you know, to the so-called unpopular sites, but we also believe that students learn probably a lot more in, in discomfort to the areas where or sites they never even imagined before. I mean, study abroad itself, I hope that yeah, Nick and Heather will agree that it's really to challenge our students to go to the territory no, well, they have never thought about, <laughs> not to quote from Star Trek, right? No man has come before, but they, they learn a lot more in discomfort and challenge themselves. Uh, regarding sites. At Goucher, we do have uh, 40 programs uh, in terms of sites, in uh, 60 sites in 40 countries, in fact. We have three different major channels. One is we do uh, have contracts or agreements with the uh, study abroad uh, providers, but at the same time, we have direct exchange program. But most excitingly, last year, we joined a partnership with a major provider that actually allowed Goucher students to go to sites without actually paying additional fee. So this is a great arrangement that we re, uh, innovated in the last year by joining this partnership. So this allows our students, and we can talk about the equi uh, equity and uh, accessibility. This allows our students to go to any place, almost anywhere they can imagine uh, without paying additional fee, just paying as long as you can afford the Goucher tuition room on the board, you're covered except the airfare ticket, air, uh, air tickets. So this is a, a great accessibility issue that we, we've done this past year. Regarding where to go, yes, we are rechanneling our students uh, to pop, unpopular places, but at the same time, the students and families have also been engaging where is gaining the attention from our current students, the Gen Z or the current uh, the upcoming students. For example, in South Korea, it, because the pop culture is gaining a lot of attention from our students, that a lot more we see during the rising that more of our students are interested in going to South Korea, for example. Yeah, we are getting it both ways. One is that we channel our students to the side where it's more challenging. At the same time, we also uh, accommodate our students' uh, desires as well. You know, I'd like I'd, I'd like uh, you Nick, to to compl uh, to comment on the different perspectives one has when one is in involved in an educational system that is unlike ours or an or attitudes cultural attitudes that are unlike ours you know it's it, it's so eye-opening when you're dealing with a problem in chemistry or you're dealing with, with a problem in the humanities and arts and all of a sudden you're surrounded by students who are speaking different languages and who are um, involved in a different cultural perspective and it really does have an impact on how you solve problems later on, doesn't it? It does. I will take the first jab and I'll leave that you know, to, to Nick and Heather to chime in. 
Uh, I have had the fortune uh, opportunity to work at the different institutions and two are STEM institutions and two others are major, uh, either flagship uh, university or major private R1 university. I've seen working with the faculty in the STEM, for example, uh, solving the solar, solar energy issue. You go to different country, whether it's in uh, Northern Europe uh, or Asia, there are different needs in the market and also different situations not only political, but engineering issues, scientific research, they, they do different projects. So if you connect the students, work on different projects, that can help them and the faculty as well, maximize the resources and thinking and the talents in tapping into the solar energy, for example. I've seen that students and faculty working on the car industry, how the Asian markets and engineering and require, and how the Australian auto industry require a different technology, how the US, it's very different. You go to Germany, that's a different setting as well. We're doing a search right now for the president of the uh, Friends, American Friends of the Alexander from Humboldt uh, mm -hmm. Foundation, which is Germany's largest uh, research institu uh, uh, foundation. And, and we're seeing that. Nick, how do you see it when, when you're talking about students who are coming from different academic disciplines uh, all of a sudden being exposed to a different academic environment and perhaps different philosophies. Yeah, it's, I, I take Wuchen's points well. Um, there's so much I want to say actually on this in different directions. I, I think one of the things that we're looking at is, is a shift away from geography to what you're going to study. And, you know, that is a hard, I think, narrative to change, but that's one that we're certainly committed to. Uh, you know, when I was at my previous institution, we had this brochure and you would open it up. And the first thing you would see is a giant map. Where do you want to go? And after we printed that, <laughs> there was this sinking feeling that I had of it was a great looking design and it showed all of our partners around the world, which was exciting, but it really wasn't asking the right question. It was more about what do you want to do? And so what do you want to do rather than where do you want to go? starts to get to how do you want to be involved and, and gets us out of that trap, I think, of the, of the Western, particularly Western European countries. Because I do think it's about socioeconomics of the locations developed, but it's, it's also about where people have gone on vacation, what people know, what they feel most comfortable with perceptions of safety, whether they're real or not, you know, versus other parts of the world. So we're getting out of our protective bubble, aren't we? We are, but if I were going to be honest and maybe kind of disrupt the conversation as well as to say, a lot of it is what students are coming in with, what those expectations are, what their parents' expectations are, right. and, and what one expects to get out of an experience like this. You know, are people going to challenge themselves? Are they primed? Are they prepared to, to challenge themselves? And I think, you know, some of that responsibility falls in lots of different places. On our end, one of the things is making sure that students are, are prepped so that we're not just kind of throwing them into the deep end. Uh, you know, research shows that that doesn't really work anyway, that if a student isn't prepared, that um, they haven't really thought through some of these issues, that they actually recoil, they minimize the differences. You know, it's too much, it's too great. I'm gonna to go to that Irish bar because that's what I know, that Irish pub, right? But, you know, when you're able to really set students up for success and for to help them really understand the nuances of a different system, then we start to get into something that's a little bit different. But there are a lot of steps that have to happen, you know, between just kind of setting up something that puts a student in a different kind of scenario and really making sure that they're ready and able to reflect and understand why they're there. And then at the end, to, to reflect on what, they're, what they've gotten out of that experience and help them integrate. You've set up, Heather, so well for, for this topic because um, you're, you're making a, such an important point, right? We're talking about young people. We're talking about education, but we're also talking about engagement, education, fun, relaxation, um, you know, exposure, um, maybe challenge but not so much challenge that, that, uh, that people are turned off. Heather, how do you help uh, organizations shape these ideas so that you strike a good balance uh, amongst all these different um, considerations? Uh, because that's in part what your, what your organization is doing, right? That's exactly right. So in my history, I actually was on college campuses 
uh, up until I came to the Institute for Study Abroad. And in that time, a lot of what I worked on was um, creating equitable access to education abroad, which we achieved and so have other campuses. In doing so though, and you know, when you've been in a career for a number of years, you start to change your thinking and your expectations about those outcomes. And what I saw um, was exactly what we're referencing that students were going abroad. Um, in some cases, they were taking classes that were directly in a major that they couldn't have served any other way. But when you really started to engage with them around what they learned, how their perspective may have changed, it was highly variable. And there were students who clearly had been in an American bubble or withdrawn from the local culture in some way because they simply weren't prepared for um, that sustained engagement with people different than themselves. And they didn't have the local support. I myself am a product of a program like that. And it's one of the reasons I really value what IFSA does uh, because our purpose is to help those students to have the support that they need when they need it, to coach them, to help them make their time abroad purposeful. It's very easy, especially on semester length programs, um, to come in with a lot of ideals and hopes and then forget them in the first three weeks when you're trying to just get established and get registered and figure out where okay. um, the local uh, clubs are and places to go. So I think there is a lot of opportunity in education abroad to deepen impact beyond what we've even seen from research because the majority of programs were not designed for the outcomes that that research has pointed to. So one of the things that you're saying is that these programs, the design of these programs themselves is so important in terms of their downstream impact. And Nick, I see you nodding. Um, uh, I'm, I'm gonna just go through a couple of uh, polls here and then I, I'd like to have uh, Lu Chen talk a little bit about the design of these programs at Goucher and, and, and how you think that they might be improved. And then we're gonna go around the table on just that topic. But the first poll that we took was, um, you know, have you or, or a member of your family or someone you know engaged in a study abroad program? And 75% of, of, of those said, said yes. Um, so we have a preponderance of people who have been exposed to this. The second poll, which I thought was really interesting, what are the top three benefits of studying abroad, everybody agreed that exposure to new cultures, ideas, ways of thinking is, is the top, uh, top benefit. And then we had personal growth. Now we also had um, about 40, 45% of the people say resume value, lifelong friends and so on. But really the two areas that really, uh, really jumped out is just the value of being exposed to difference. And, and different ways of thinking. Um, and then the final poll was really interesting. What steps should institution take to assure student access to study abroad? And the biggest responses we got were to provide scholarships and to enhance uh, support systems for, for uh, students uh, from diverse backgrounds. So Luchan, in terms of the program design, the, the topic that Heather uh, basically raised and that Nick commented on, how do you feel that these programs can be improved over the next several years um, as we look forward? Because as Heather had mentioned, there was, there's there been a real shift with the advent of these interactive experiences. Education has gone more online. Um, how can we complement the electronic connection to remote learning to an in-person connection that is more textured, more exciting, more engaging, and gives people a better understanding of the world. And how, how should these programs evolve? Should we follow the Goucher model of requiring study abroad of all of our students? That's a great question um, and topic to discuss here, Mark. If I, I'd be happy to share how Goucher does, and actually even our design and our approach to study abroad have been evolving and improving constantly. That's what we call it innovative, right, innovation. And traditionally, our students here, they come to Goucher, they know they will have to study abroad as a requirement. And our freshman year, we have a freshman, a first year experience seminar. We call it the first year FYIs. Students will actually learn initially in the first semester they are here to study, to learn about what the four years might be, including study abroad, the global experience learning. And then even during the study abroad, normally between the second year, and the third year, most of them will study abroad. They actually have the uh, plans out 
And also, it's not just a study abroad. I like to quote what Heather said in the purposefulness, you know, this study abroad. It's not only just the travel from point A to point B, it's what they gain through the study abroad experience. As Nick said earlier about the, the practical reasons, the values we discussed about study abroad, but there are other reasons. For example, more scholarly. We at Gauter encourage our students through a structured way to study RPP, we call it race, power and perspectives. It's called RPP, it's a course. It's called IDS 201Y. When our students are abroad studying, take whatever courses they are overseas. At the same time, we remotely from home at Goucher have coordinated with the students how their experience actually helped them understand the race, power, and perspectives from all different parts of the world, how they are engaged in the local communities as well to enhance their understanding cross-culturally. So that's that's one example, but that's also being innovated. Uh, for example, during the pandemic, our faculty and staff created another course they called IDS 310, a global engagement seminar. That actually engages not only our faculty from different disciplines, but also from our alum. We, we, we use leverage the technology, get our alum chime in to the class to share with our students what's happening in their industry, in their field, or in their personal life that's globally engaged or connected. So those are very enriching experience for our students in the classroom. The other one is to really talk about scholarship, as you mentioned, how we innovate this uh, uh, study abroad program to provide more equity and accessibility. We have, we are very fortunate, thanks to our advancement uh, team, we have great scholarships provided to our students, students who have demonstrated the need and financial aid. So that's another area we've been providing more equity so, into the study abroad. So, Luchun, it seems that, that what you're advocating is a mm-hmm. full-on integration yeah. of the in-person experience of being in different countries, interacting mm-hmm. with different people, um, and, and connecting that to every aspect of the academic experience. Nick, are, is, is Elon, given that you're number one or you're, you've been rated as, 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 um, as, as number one, there, there's an intentionality about getting that rating, right? That, that permeates these systems, right? It, it, it doesn't necessarily um, uh, mean that, that any other institution is lesser in these respects than you are, but there's an intentionality of focusing your energies to achieve that kind of rating. Are you also at Elon thinking about international education as being completely integrated throughout everything that you do? Yeah, we are humbled by what other campuses are doing. Uh, you know, there's so much for us to be learning. Um, the way I've been thinking about this recently is looking at uh, for an undergraduate as global as a four year experience. I think when we're talking about study abroad, we're often talking about a one-off experience. You know, you go for three weeks, you go for a semester, maybe you even go for a full year. Maybe you do a dual degree program, but it's still a limited amount of time and you check that off, right? You check off a number of other kinds of experiences that prepare you. So if we think about this as a four-year experience, it goes to Lu Chen's point. So on our campus, we've got a core course, which is our global experience. All students have to take it. So that is in year one. If we then look at what happens, study abroad is typically uh, third year. And then fourth year is our, our capstone, which can, doesn't always, but can have a global experience. Right now we're mapping out, and I would say we're in the process of this um, as we retool for the next decade as part of our strategic planning. Um, what would it look like if we really saw at all levels and all points of a student's trajectory through Elon, this, this, this global piece? And I would say here, to come back to what Heather was talking about, um, you know, diversity, equity, inclusion is important as well. As we think about how these pieces connect so we're not just promoting global for the sake of global, but that we're thinking about how diversity, equity, inclusion, those discussions around inclusive excellence ties into this work because it's all about difference at the end of the day. There needs to be separate spaces for each to, to be able to acknowledge the students, particularly that have been underrepresented, but there there's still great connections there. Um, and so, you know, we're, when we start to think about this in different kinds of ways, we say that study abroad, about 84, 85% of our students go abroad. So it's less than what Lu Chen has on his campus at Goucher. 
But, you know, that, that still means there are, you know, 20 plus uh, percent of our students that have not had that. Where else in this curriculum can, they make, can we make sure that they get that? And how can we make sure that these, these experiences are stacked on? And how can we make sure that students are really reflecting at different points and that we're intentional about giving those moments for reflection? And I know that Heather and others in organizations have been thinking about this as well, particularly how external organizations can support the efforts of campuses. On our end, we're really thinking about from the campus perspective, how do we, how do we really manage that, that process? It's, uh, what great points. This whole idea, and Luchan made the point as well. Nick, you just made the point. Heather, we're going to give you the last word. This idea of, of uh, integrating and involving everyone and finding ways to fund that involvement so that income does not act as a drag on the experience um, so that we can engage all of our students. Heather, this must be very welcome news for you at the Institute. And I particularly like Nick's uh, point about thinking about education as a different type of experience where partnering with other institutions so that you can have a Elon experience or a Goucher experience from no matter where you are in the world, right? Um, so how are you shifting your organization to accommodate these, this kind of thinking uh, that you're seeing coming out of your colleagues in the field? You know, it's interesting. We are all on these parallel trajectories right now. Um, you know, a lot of what Nick and Lucena have shared resonates really closely with what we're thinking and talking about and what we're hearing across our partner network. Um, for IFSA as well, we are really thinking more and more about partnership as the way we move forward and engaging our partners in what comes next in terms of program development and design. And that has been going on for a while. Um, one of the ways in which we've tried to support campus efforts to make the study abroad exper uh, experience integrated was by um, offering our campus partners access to student um, roadmaps, which are basically their personal, professional, and academic goals for their time abroad, where we coach and mentor them during the semester and help them learn about SMART goals and planning along the way. Um, we did that because our campus partners asked for access as a way to carry that experience back to campus. Um, and that's the kind of thinking that we're utilizing all the time as we engage with um, our different campuses, both in the US, but also globally. Um, we work with a, a very prestigious network of institutions that are um, engaged in the, the educational process for these international students. Our students are their international students. And so the partnership needs to happen on both sides. So you're, you're enabling the transformation. It's just a wonderful uh, note to end on. Uh, Dr. Heather Barkley Hamir, President and CEO of the Institute for Study Abroad. Dr. Nick Gozik, Dean of Global Education at Elon University in North Carolina. And Dr. Lu Chen Li, Associate Vice President of Global Education at Goucher College of Maryland. Thank you so much for sharing this really important topic. It, it's really been wonderful to learn from you. And, and please thank your colleagues um, at your universities and organizations. Please thank your supporters. Thank your students. Thank your professors who are advancing international education and understanding in this, in this very complicated world that we have. It's, it's, it's really wonderful. And on Thursday, we're going to be talking about workplace mental health and well-being. So please uh, do join us uh, then. Thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Thank you.